Testing, can you hear me? There it is. Ooh, that one sounds like it says something. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. It's so great to see the top half of all your faces. Uh, I'm just going to assume you're grinning at me, and uh, that's, that's the reality I want to live in. So, all right. Welcome. Today we are talking about creative plus strategic plus individualized to build a strategy that is going to be emotionally and spiritually fulfilling for you. So you can enjoy every day and not be living for that sort of nebulous success that someday you'll hit and everyone will love you and your, your parents will give you the apologies that you deserve, right? So we're going to talk about uh, how you can use that to select the right tips and tricks to build your dream career. So welcome to Information Overload, also known as 20 Books to 50K Vegas. Um, so here are some facts. <laughs> We are on the last day of this conference before you know the book signing and everything. So there are a million things you could add to your to-do list. Uh, some of you may have added very close to a million already. You cannot do them all, nor do you want to deep down. Um, so you have to choose which ones to do. So you need some criteria for that. Because what happens if you choose wrong? What happens if you don't consciously choose, maybe you just work your way down from the top of the list and see what happens. Just throw that spaghetti up against the wall and see what sticks. Well, five years later, are there more than two people in this room that get that meme? <laughs> all right, all right. So this, is, this, of course, is from I Think You Should Leave, which is my favorite sketch show and has gotten me through the pandemic. So. Um, Five years later, if you're not consciously choosing, if you're not coming at this with a really clear idea of what you need, um, your emotional needs that you need to have fulfilled, you're, you could quit writing. It's just not working for you. It's not fun anymore. Uh, maybe you're still not making money five years later. That's super frustrating, and that happens to a lot of people. Or maybe you're making just a little money, which is somehow more torturous, right? You think, I've made a little bit. Maybe I can make a lot, but it's just not working. And you're tired, and you're getting burned out. Um, or you're making a ton of money, and you hate what you do. Congratulations. You've managed to ruin your dream. Um, or you become a bitter indie author, and if you are in this industry long enough, you will encounter these. They would rather come after you on Facebook or um, K-Boards, RIP. I don't even know that's around anymore. Um, then write the book, right? So we don't want to join those ranks. Um, and you'll end up going, we're all trying to find the guy who did this. It was you. So there are three questions you really need to answer to make sure that you are on the right track, that you're choosing things intelligently. Um, but first, I'll just like explain who I am real quick. It's not that important. But um, I'm a fiction author. I have 33 books out under uh, my various pen names. So that is what I do full time, and all my consulting stuff is overtime. <laughs> um, but I write as H. Claire Taylor. That's my satire. Brock Bloodworth um, is my paranormal police comedy. I write paranormal cozy mystery as Nova Nelson. And then I have a crime fiction pen name that I'm not telling you. You don't get to read it yet. Um, I was also a professional editor for years. I have edited over 200 manuscripts, a lot of them romance. Um, I was an in-house editor at a romance publishing company for a while. And then I'm a fiction strategist. So that is kind of what FFS Media, if you've gotten the button. If you didn't get a button, we. My lovely husband just dropped off some more, so you can get that afterwards. Um, so that is what I do. I work with authors. We talk about story, so I can help you fix your story. I can help you get it unstuck. I can help you make it totally unforgettable wherever you're at with that. Um, and then we also talk about genre, and we talk about author life. And today we'll be talking more about that author life part of it. Um, and then I'm also the host of the Sell More Book Show with Brian Cohen. Some of you may have heard of me from there, or maybe that's why you're here. So welcome. This is what I look like. <laughs> um, all right, so this is when authors come to me. They come to me if their story is stuck. So plot holes, flat characters. Oh, give me a flat character. I'll put that thing through the ringer. I love it. Um, they've fallen out of love with their story. Who here has fallen out of love with a story you've been writing at some point? All right, we've got some really honest people. I love it. Um, if you want to take your story to the next level, this happens a lot. If you have written a really successful series and it's time to do another series, 
Ooh, hope that doesn't flop. You want to make sure that book one gets off on the right foot. And so we will really develop it and take it to that next level so that your readers go over and go, oh my gosh, they just get better every book. Um, if you're burning out on your genre or series, I can help you. We will, um, it's basically like marriage counseling for you and your book. <laughs> we like to do that. Um, if you've hit a wall in your career and you just don't know what to do next, we talk about that. And there is a tool that helps me with all of these things, and we will talk about it. Um, and I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Um, so, and then if they need a major career pivot, and much, much more. You can tell I've been spending a lot of time with Brian Cohen that I add, and much, much more on everything. Okay, so you may be sitting here today thinking that something is not working and you need to make a pivot. Something doesn't feel 100% right. So the good news is it's never a bad time to adjust your trajectory. Um, and it's never a bad time to put together your big picture. So we're going to start today. Um, and that might mean that you have to get rid of some of the things you're doing or let go of some of the things you think you should be doing so that you can actually experience emotional and spiritual fulfillment in this career. Um, I want you to avoid lost time and money. If you're just getting started in this, great. This is a perfect time to get clear on these things so that you don't you know, end up five years later. We're all trying to find the guy that did this. Um, and I want you to enjoy the process. There are some people who will get up and tell you that if you're enjoying it, you're not working hard enough. That's bullshit. So uh, we're not doing that. Uh, we are doing what, what we enjoy. If you don't want to enjoy every day, go into a more lucrative profession, right? There's all kinds of ways to make money. Um, and we want to do what fills you up. Okay, so here are the three questions you need to answer. Probably not right now, because this is going to take some deep thinking, some hard uh, emotional confrontation with yourself, maybe some tears, maybe some alcohol. You never know, whatever works for you. So what do I want my writing to do for me? What do I want my writing to do for others? Because if we weren't altruistic in this, we would just be journaling. And what do I want my money to do for me? And we don't ask, what do I want my money to do for others? Because once you give it to them, it's theirs. They get to do with it what they want. But OK, so let's break these down. So, Because I know these are very vague questions, and it can be very abstract. So here are some examples of what you might want your writing to do for you. I want my writing to help me rumble with moral complexity. Right? If you like to pick a theme and just tear at it for a book and put your characters in positions where there's no pure moral choice, that's giving you something. That's helping you grapple, grapple with your own um, emotional questions. And that's what writing is doing for you. I want my writing to be a place where I feel safe to be myself. This is very common, especially if you're writing a genre that can be a little bit more taboo, right? Um, or if you are really writing anything, you want to write a character that, that you wish you could be if you didn't feel the constraints of the life you're living. I want my writing to be a place to escape to each day. Not all of us have the best life situation. Um, maybe that's why you started writing out or writing. Um, maybe that's why you still write. It's a totally acceptable reason to write, but you want to figure out if that's for you, if it's a, an escape. I want my writing to bring me control I don't experience in daily life. Right? We can't control everything, but in our story world, we are God. So that can be a really nice feeling, especially when the world feels like it's spinning out of control. All right. What do I want my writing to do for others? So this is well, the feedback we like to get from our readers. We like to know what we're giving them because it feels good to have something to offer the world. <laughs> Um, so an example, I want my writing to help my readers understand themselves better, right? Maybe you cover some, um, you know, emotional intelligence concepts in your book. Maybe you model behavior that your readers have never seen, positive behavior. Um, maybe you have some really great dialogue where characters talk about those deep, you know, um, insecurities and that sort of thing. And then your readers will start to understand themselves better through it. I want my writing to make my readers feel seen. So this could be either representation, like external representation, or you're writing a kind of character and personality that people don't usually see. 
Um, no matter what character you write, there's someone who probably has not seen it before and is going to feel seen when they, when they do encounter it. I want my writing to inspire others to go for their dreams, right? We can be really inspirational. We can be the cheerleader that our readers may not have in their life by showing them that courage that they need. I want my writing to challenge and confront my readers' dearest beliefs about the world, right? Now more than ever, we're a little bit siloed in our you know, political and ideolo our ideological worlds, especially online. So maybe you want to sneak into some of the people in your silo and present new ideas and challenge them. They may not change their mind, but we always love a good challenge. All right, what do I want my money to do for me? This one is touchy. Usually when I start talking about money, someone wants to shout me down. So let me just say, I like money, okay? I'm not telling you to not make money. I'm not telling you that you can't make money in this career. But when you make money, I want you to know what that means for you because it does not mean the same thing. People go crazy when we talk about money. So we want to know what emotional thing we are getting from our money. So here are some examples. I want my money to open up options for me to explore and enjoy the world. I think Jamie was talking about in her uh, talk today, was it Nick Thacker who said he wanted to be able to not worry about money and travel the world? That's an example of this. You don't need an unlimited amount of money to do this. You just need to know what you want your money to go toward. I want my money to s help support the people around me when they need help, right? That can feel really good for some people. That is it, to have enough money to be able to help out your friends and family when they need it. That is going to be exactly, that's going to feel really good for you on that deep soul level when you're able to do that. I want my money to keep me from having to sacrifice my values just to pay my bills. If you're a person where integrity trumps all, then you will want to make sure that you have enough money so that you don't end up in a position where you have to choose something that does not align with your values. And then lastly, I want my money to support me in other intellectual pursuits. Maybe you just need enough money to be able to go get that doctorate you've always wanted. Maybe you just want to sit around and read all day and you just need enough money to pay your bills to do that. You don't need a big house to read a lot. Okay, so here's where I give you a little tough love. Um, you get one answer for each of these, all right? You're gonna feel a little bit in a lot of directions, but when you have two top priorities, one will, you'll end up straddling between the two, and you won't be able to really fully commit to either. And when you, those two conflict with one another, because they will eventually conflict, right? You want to know which one is going to bring you the most and the deepest and most lasting fulfillment so that you can know ahead of time because emotions in real time are tricky things. <laughs> we like to make those decisions and know that, that about ourselves prior to the hard choices. Um, so the great news is that you do have a single core desire above all others. Um, and I know that sounds kind of weird, but I promise it'll make more sense because we're going to start identifying that core desire with a little thing I call the Enneagram. Yeah. Has anyone heard me talk about the Enneagram? <laughs> All right. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, okay. So we'll talk about the Enneagram in a second. But you want to start asking yourself, how can your writing satisfy that core desire on a daily level, on a weekly level, year after year? So we're going to look at some short-term and some long-term examples. Um, and how can your money satisfy that? All right, another meme, sorry. Um, so this is the Enneagram. And this is you going, I don't know what any of this shit is and I'm fucking scared. <laughs> um, yes, it looks, it looks like some weird occult symbol. Um, I know it's, I'm not trying to recruit you into anything. I don't want to be responsible for grown adults. Um, I don't want to be a leader of all that. So this is the wheel of the Enneagram. And so each type of Enneagram. You've got the number and you've got a descriptive name for that type. And each type has its own core desire and core fear. And together, desire and fear equal motivation. So when I say core motivation, I'm talking about two sides of that same coin, the fear and the desire. They often are just the reverse of each other, as I'll show you in just a second. Okay, so here are the core motivations. 
One of these may stand out to you as we go through. It'll feel a little bit like an attack. Uh, that is how you know that it's probably good. Some of these are going to go, eh, maybe. Some are going to go, hmm, I'd have to think more about that. There are tests for this. There are books for this. You can come find me after I can give you resources um, or I can talk to you for five minutes and say, maybe, maybe like, look up these two types and just see what, what you find. Um, so we have the reformer. This is all about goodness, integrity. If a reformer is asked to sacrifice their integrity, they're going to feel ab bad about it for a long time. That's that 4 a.m. I should have done moment. Um, so we need, to, we need to respect that core value if you are a, a reformer. Helpers need to be needed. They want to be helpful to other people. Um, and, they're, and at the core of that, it's because they don't want to be unwanted or unloved. So if you have a person in your life who is really pushing their help on you, you're probably dealing with a helper, and that's why. It's not a flaw. It's just their personality. Achiever. That is to be worthy of love, and it, it's a fear of being worthless. No one wants to be worthless, but not all of us are acting with that at the core of our behavior. We find worth in a lot of things, right? We can find worth in ourselves regardless of what the world thinks of us. So achievers tend to have, they tend to lean heavily on uh, New York Times bestseller thing on their book, right? These, these awards and these um, certificates and acknowledgement is really important to them. And that's not to dismiss it. It just goes back to that. None of these are better than the other one. Um, individualist, they want to be themselves. They're afraid of being insignificant. They like to be unique. They're um, that sort of uh, person that's like, oh, I don't write in a genre. <laughs> You're like, okay. I'm like, mm, type four. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. You are unique. So it's about that sort of journey is the one that you're taking. Investigator, typical investigator is like Sherlock Holmes, right? Very much into the data. They want to be competent. Um, they're afraid of being helpless or incapable. So if you were at the humor panel yesterday, I was talking about these two in a romance and how that would be an interesting conflict because one needs to help the other needs to feel self-sufficient. That one's going to be pushing on that one. That one's going to say, no thanks. Um, and that would be the, the conflict between those two personality types. Then we have the loyalists to be supported. Um, they're afraid of being unsupported. It's all about social support and security. And that's their first priority, is making sure that they're in a safe environment. They're really good at figuring out what might go wrong. If you want to know what might go wrong in your, in your plan, Ask a type six, they'll give you uh, 55 ways. So then we have the seven, the enthusiast. That's all about satisfaction. But deep down, they're, they're terrified of being trapped in emotional pain and discomfort. So if you have a friend who likes to, or you like to triple book yourself, so the day of, you can decide which one it seems the most fun, and you're not committed to something that doesn't seem fun in the moment, that's probably a type seven, right? But type sevens are, they get to crap jokes. They like to keep the mood fun. If you try and bring down the mood, they will ignore you. Um, and then we have the types, type eight, the challenger. That's all about fear of being harmed or controlled by others. So challengers are natural leaders. Um, they can be benevolent leaders or not. Uh, but they like to be in charge. And there are probably a lot of type eights in this room just because indie publishing, you get to be in charge. And then we have the peacemaker. They want to have peace of mind. They fear being separate or cut off from people. They are the eternal diplomat. They um, will find something about you and reflect it back to you. They will find your best quality and reflect it back to you. They organize groups. They're like the glue of groups. And if you need them to confront somebody, it will not happen. <laughs> it, it, as they grow and mature, they may be able to do it, but it's going to take a lot more out of a peacemaker to have a confrontation than it is a challenger who just gets off on that. So it's really important to try and figure out which one you are because different tasks will take different amounts of energy from you. And different ones will feed you more energy. So we're going to go through an example of those three questions. We're going to use the type two, the helper. So remember, their fear and desire is to be needed um, or unwanted and unloved. They don't want to be unwanted and unloved, right? Very community-focused type twos, very family-focused in general. Um, 
So here are the three questions, and we will go more in depth into the, each of these answers, and these are just examples. If you're a type two, this might really resonate with you. If you're not, this might remind you of someone you know. So the first question, what do I want my writing to do for me? A type two might say, and this is not universal for the type, but it, it's going to be something along these lines, probably. I want to write stories that help me love myself more, right? That help me feel more loved. Um, and the only th person you can control is yourself, right? Um, and then what do we want my writing to do for others? It might be that I want to write stories that make my readers love themselves more, right? Show themselves a little more self-love. And then what do I want my money to do for me? Maybe I earn enough that I don't need to ask for assistance and can instead help others when they need it. And now this is very vague, right? Are we helping others um, buy a house? Or are we helping others pay for their coffee, right? So you can do this. You can make your money do this at any amount of money, right? This is something we can fulfill at any level, and we'll talk about that a little more in a second. So let's go through the daily short-term fulfillment and the yearly long-term fulfillment for each of these questions for the same example of that helper. So if you want to write stories that help you love yourself more, which is free therapy, you guys. It's not a bad deal. Um, you could send out snippets for positive feedback, right, to your, to your readers. They're going to give you that positive feedback. They may give you negative feedback. You block that email. Um, you don't need that in your life. Um, so that will give you sort of that, like, oh, yeah, see, see what you did reflected back to you. See your positive qualities reflected back to you by your super fans. That's going to feel really good. Um, Write the scenes you are best at, right? If you are looking to feel like you have something to give, don't just keep giving stuff that you don't value, right? If you write really good sex scenes, write really good sex scenes. Don't try and write a, a fight scene if you can't write it, right? Figure out what you're really good at and write a ton of that. It's going to benefit your books, and it's going to fulfill you a lot more on that daily when you sit down. And, you know, if you have 10 days of writing, and you end eight of them feeling, man, I kind of rock. That's going to be a much better situation, and you're going to be much more likely to sit down the next day. Um, and then sharing your flaws with readers to feel less alone yourself, right? You share your embarrassing moments. I know an author who is very good at sharing her embarrassing moments, a type two, the, the beautiful Jamie Albright. Um, <laughs> and she, you know, you're going to get that feedback of people going, oh, my gosh, I did that same thing. Um, that actually happened to me the other day. <laughs> Do you mind if I share this story? Okay. <laughs> Jamie was telling me, she had just sent this out to her email list. Um, oh my gosh, you know, I walked into this bathroom and only <laughs> once I realized I, that there was a urinal there, did I realize I was in the wrong bathroom and I ran out, et cetera, et cetera. I have never walked into a men's bathroom in my life. Not like, you know, by accident. Um, and the next day, I walked into one here. So uh, I was like, oh, Jamie, damn it. Um, but, you know, I felt a lot less alone knowing Jamie was breaking into. Um, so, yeah, you can, you can share that, and you'll get that feedback that you need. It's okay to need feedback. Um, if you need it, you need it. And then yearly long-term fulfillment. Um, you can take stock of your growing readership. I always track your growth. Always. We want to dismiss our abilities our skills and our growth as soon as they happen. We want to say, well, that wasn't hard. That's not a big deal. Always track it. Track your words. Track what you did every day. You want to be able to see that you did something. So track your reader growth. Because if you're a type 2 especially, that's going to give you that fulfillment. When you look back, and you go, oh, nobody likes my stuff. Right? You're just projecting, but nobody likes my stuff. And then you go and you look, oh, wait. My email list doubled this year. That's pretty cool. So maybe somebody likes my stuff. So you want to track that sort of thing. Um, write characters that are struggling to be loved. Right? Write your struggle in general. Um, again, it is free therapy, guys. And then explore the themes of helping and enabling. That's going to be a big thing for a type 2. So you want to explore themes. And I talk about this in some of my free courses and stuff. But you want to explore themes that hit that core fear and desire, because that's going to help you grow. It's going to be the most, um, the most authentic 
discovery of it. And you're going to attract readers who are also in that process. And they're going to go, oh my gosh, it's like she wrote that for me. Um, so you want to expl explore themes of help, enabling, belonging, self-love, all these things that are around your type. What do I want my writing to do for others? So the daily short-term fulfillment. Some things you can do is write imperfect characters overcoming because you're going to be remembering that your readers need this and it's going to be you're helping them. You're showing them, right? We learn through story. We learn all of our emotional you know, lessons, all our wisdom through story. So that is something you're going to be helping them with. Communicating with readers individually. That is something you can help others with, and it's going to fill you up if you're a type 2. If you're a type 5, um, giving basically live counseling to your readers is going to feel like hell. So, you know, it's, it goes type by type. So, but for a 2, this might work. And then ask them to share their troubles so you can actually help them and they can help you. It's very mutually beneficial. And then long term, um, yearly and long term, creating reliably comforting stories, a safe place for them. Um, a lot of your readers are going to be helpers and they are going to need that, a place where they can see that these characters are enough and you love the character, imperfect characters enough, you might start to love yourself. Um, you're gonna wanna happily ever after, the HEA, you're gonna, Gonna wanna give your readers, that's something you can do for them to make them feel good. Um, and then again, incorporating self-help concepts um, into your writing is something that you can do. All right, for the third question, what do I want my money to do for me? So if it's enough to ask for, us to not need to ask people for help, because helpers do not like asking for help, because it's, if you can give help, that's a plus one. If you ask for help, that's a negative one on you know how much you're worthy of love or whatever. Um, so short term, you can reinvest the gains back into the business with your money if you're in a position to do that because that is an act of showing yourself that you're worthy of that love. Um, you can use sales to take a friend to coffee if they've had a bad day, right? When you're not in Vegas, coffee doesn't cost $9 a piece, so... <laughs> You can probably afford that with just selling a couple books. You don't need to be making a ton of money, right? And you can go take that friend out, and it's going to make you feel really good in the right kind of way. Um, and then long-term, yearly, if you could pay for a family trip, that would be fantastic to, to go help all your family. Maybe not all of your family can afford a trip, and you take some. Or you, you know, maybe you're mentoring, and you take your little brother or little sister there or something like that. Um, or if you're making a ton of money, you can fix someone else's financial woes in some way. And those are things that are going to fill you up. They will drain other types, but they're going to fill you up if you're a type 2. Okay, so how to actually apply all of this, right? So once we have these three questions answered for ourselves, go back to your list of things that you need to do after this conference that you must do if you want to be successful. Um, most of them you don't need to do. So... Going through, starting a Facebook reader group, if you're a type two, would you focus on this and how would you focus on this? Now, a Facebook reader group could be really good for a helper. If it's functioning in the right way, if it's somewhere where people feel like they can come for help um, or to just share something that's on their mind and you can interact with them and you can get that back and forth interaction that we just talked about. You could do that if you structure and moderate, of course, your Facebook reader group the right way. Craft development, okay, well, obviously I think everyone should be developing their craft all the time, um, but how would you do that and why? So I would say something like if you want to be able to love yourself more through your stories, develop those things that you really love about yourself. If you write really good uh, car chase scenes, right? Go read some really good car chase scenes and see what you like about them and see what works and what doesn't and start practicing. Right? So that's a way you could use craft development to fulfill that need. Creating merchandise. You could if you know it'll make you feel more loved when you see your, your work on other people. But it may not be the most effective thing. Um, you would have to decide how that would make you feel based on um, if it makes you feel loved or if it makes you feel weird. Um, which sometimes it does feel weird. Um, and then go with that, Cr writing to trend. Okay, so this is a big one, right? Writing to trend. If you are a helper, you might want to do this, but I don't know that this is going to be the best way because this is going to, when you write to trend, you're chasing something a little bit, right? If you write in a, a genre that, that has a trend upward, great, lucky you. It'll all come around, right? Um, 
but it may not fulfill that need. It may make you money, but if you're not doing this and this in it, then it's going to leave you empty in five years, and you're going to be wearing that hot dog suit. Um, rapid release, that is a real easy trigger. There's some types that are going to be very much triggered um, when they have that much pressure on them to produce that fast. If you care about quality a lot, which some people do, and you're not willing to sacrifice that, rapid release is going to be a real test for you. I'm not saying you can't do it, but you need to be aware that um, this is not always going to leave you feeling good. <laughs> Um, it may be that you don't need to make as much money as you thought once you go through what you want your money to do for you. And if that is the case, then um, maybe you don't need to do it so fast, right? Just as Becca says, question the premise. Um, and then international translations. This is a really interesting one for if you're type two. If you get fed by talking to readers, how do you talk to them <laughs> if they don't speak your language? <laughs> Is finding a bunch of new readers in different countries who speak different languages, is that actually going to fill you up? Or should you maybe focus on something else at, at that moment? And then once you're making enough money to pay someone else to do that, eh, you can get a little more money that way. But it's just not going to fill you up. I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying consider it before you feel the need to do it. And if it is going to fill you up, or if there are other ways from this list that could do the same thing, make you the money you need, and um, feel better and be more exciting. Oh, and the newsletter building, which I want to go back, see if I can. OK, uh, and then newsletter building, yes, just, just do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you listen to the Sell More Book Show, yeah, everybody should be building a, a newsletter. I'm, I'm firm on that. But how you do it matters, right? Do you tell them personal stories? Do you just give them discounts? Do like what kind of personal stories? So you can build, you can make your newsletter fit any of the Enneagram types and fulfill any need. But make sure that you're thinking about what your need is and the person who told you how to do a newsletter isn't a different type from you, right? Because if you just take whatever they said and do it exactly like that, but they are, say, a type three and you're, uh, you know, a type six, it's not going to feel the same. It's not going to fulfill that need that you have. So you want to make sure that you're figuring that out and tailoring it appropriately. OK, so now it's your turn. So number one is you're going to want to figure out your core motivations. Here are a few places. Enneagraminstitute.com is really good. You can take a test. They, I think there's just paid. You don't have to do that. There are free tests. But no matter what, take your top few scores and read up on them. You can read up on Enneagraminstitute.com for free. Um, and I'm not affiliated with them. I don't care if they make money. I don't, whatever. I don't care. I'm just, I think this is a great resource that I send people to. The Road Back to You is also a really good book. Um, it's very short and it's about the Enneagram. And the wisdom of the Enneagram is kind of written like a textbook. Um, but if you get into it, if you end up deep in it like I am, um, you might want to have that to just reference. And then, of course, I can always chat with you guys about it. I'm happy to do that. So once you kind of figure out what your core motivation is, uh, you can then start to answer these questions. And these are ones that you're going to want to think about for a while. You don't need to know them right away. Um, but this is sort of a meditation, right? What do I want my money to do for me? Or what do I want my writing to do for me? What do I want my writing to do for others? What do I want my money to do for me? And then I want you to create some daily fulfillment activities that are going to feed that, that are going to make you uh, soothe that fear and healthfully encourage that desire. And then you're going to do the same thing for long-term goals. So that is your homework, essentially. Um, and here's another meme. That is a good idea. Yes, I agree. Um, evaluate your to-do list from the conference. So this is when you get home, right? We're in it. We can't make good decisions right now. We're in it. We're maxed out. <laughs> you know, we've never seen this many people with masks on trying to read eye expressions. We're all introverts for the most part. Um, we, you know, we, we are out of it right now. This is not where you make emotionally responsible decisions. So um, once you're home, evaluate your to-do list from the conference. So which tasks support your short-term and long-term fulfillment the most? And then how do you make each task support your core desires? So you don't need to cut one if it just it doesn't immediately lend itself. But you can massage certain tasks to fulfill that need. So that is, um, and then some 
So I'm just, it would be such a stretch that you're like, hey, maybe I don't have to do that. And great, you have my permission to not do any of the tactics you've heard if you don't like them. Any of them. You don't have to do it. You'd be amazed. Some people don't even have an email list, and they make good money. Um, and they're outliers. Don't do it. Get an email list. <laughs> okay, so I do have a free course. And basically what we've gone over is our creative values today. And this, this sorry, this graphic cracks me up. I made it. Um, I was a little sleep deprived. And I was like, this looks like a tabloid, doesn't it? <laughs> like a British tabloid, like... I'm in some royal wedding, or maybe I divorced an old rich billionaire or something. Um, so I kept it because it made me happy. Uh, it, it's silly, but it makes me happy. So yeah, I do have this free course. Um, so we go over the creative values like we've done today. I talk more about them a little bit more in depth. Then we talk about author persona, how you are going to present yourself to your readers. Then we drill down to what themes, based on your Enneagram type, are really going to get you going make you want to just explore them um, for possibly a series, possibly multiple series. And then we're going to talk about your protagonists. And yes, you can use the Enneagram for your characters. And it's really fun. It's like the closest thing to a writing hack that exists. And then on day five, we'll bring it all together. OK, so if you want to sign up, that is, you can sign up now and take it any time. Um, it's totally free. Um, you don't, I'm not going to like sell you on anything. I have plenty of people who take it and they're like, that's good. That's enough for me. And I'm like, great. Go with God, you know? So you can sign up there. I think all I have left is, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So we have about three minutes for questions. If anyone has questions, there's a mic right there. Um, I'm happy to answer in those three minutes. All right. We got Troy coming up. find that you kind of bridge two of the numbers is that um, I think I think you're broken <laughs> no no um, that, that happens you will have some some really close calls um, what I like to do is if there are two that you're not sure about try and create a scenario where you could only fulfill one or the other so if you think oh I might be a one but I might be an eight so I might be that reformer who is um, worried about integrity, but I'm also a challenger. Maybe I'm a challenger who worries about power. Well, if you had, you were in a situation where you had to choose what was what you thought was right or what you thought would keep you the most power, which one would you choose? And that's going to guide you towards your type. Um, there are also these things called wings. So if you are a type two, a wing could be a number on either side of you. So it could be a one or a three. And that's going to be another quality that you're going to kind of take on secondary. So that can make it a little bit trickier. But um, yeah, that's like 201. That's like sophomore level. So any other questions? We got a little more time. All right. They're all on ffs.media. Yeah. Oh, oh uh, she asked, where are, what kind of courses do I sell? And they're all on ffs.media. I have story courses, Supercharger Story, Supercharger Series. And then I have this free course. And then I do offer consulting for author and story. Uh, well, I am only here to say that Clara's saved my bacon on at least three books that I have. So all of this makes total sense to me when she breaks it down for me. So just here as an advocate. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> so we have time for probably one more question. Does anyone else have a question? I know we covered a lot. The Enneagram is a big topic. I mostly just wanted to introduce it to you so you have that to do a little self-study because it's definitely a self-study sort of thing. Hi. Hi. At what point, if you um, kind of take everything, take into stock, and decide I'm not going with my values or maybe I should do a pivot, at what point are you doing something that would fit with you better or just using it as an excuse to chase something different? Yeah, so that is a great question. And I think um, there's a lot of self-searching that goes into figuring out kind of what your core motivation is. But once you know it, um, you you can always like try and fool yourself, right? But um, you will start to feel over time if you're not doing that. You'll be exhausted. Um, you will not feel like doing the thing that you do anymore. Um, and so it's, it's 
getting out of alignment, essentially, is what it is. And you know when you're out of alignment because something doesn't feel right. And so this is how I help people get back into alignment. And there are some um, types that are more or less valued in our society. So that can also be a real trick because if you're a type that is not valued in this society, and society could be the country, it could be this conference, it could be your family. If it's not valued, you're going to think it's bad and you're going to try to avoid it. And that is what starts to cause that dissonance. But all types are good. So. Uh, and I think that does it, right? We're we done? All right. Thank you guys so much for coming.